All right, so thanks, Judy. Um, my name is Dave Bodine. I'm a branch chief of the genetics and molecular biology branch here in the intramural program of NHGRI. Um, we're going to have three speakers in this session Ji Hong Lin from Harvard, uh, Tuli Lapalainen uh, from the New York Genome Center, and Marjorie Brand from the Ottawa Research Institute. I want to remind the speakers that each talk is to be 15 minutes long, and I will bust in uh, when you have one minute to go. Uh, and that will leave us time, uh, five minutes or so, for questions um, at the end. So uh, in order to make the best use of our time, I think I should stop talking and, and introduce Ji Hong. Uh, Ji Hong Lin is the professor in both the Department of Statistics and the Quantitative Genomics at Harvard. Um, and She's an associate member also at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT. Her research interests lie in the development and application of statistical and computational methods for analysis of big data from genome, exposome, and phenome, and scalable statistical inference for learning in big genomic and epidemi epidemiological and health data. So, Xi Hong, I think I just uh, took up half your time with the bio, but uh, Please take over, and uh, we're very interested to hear what you have to say. Hey, thank you, David, and thanks, the organizer, for inviting me. And uh, my talk uh, will be on big uh, genetic omic data and the computational technology. So I'll first introduce what type of data we have right now. So in the last few years, and the uh, uh, whole genome sequencing effort has generated several large whole genome sequencing data, including the GSP uh, uh, CCDG data by NHGRI, which include 140,000 whole gen genome and 210,000 whole exome. And also TopMed has generated uh, 120,000 plus a whole genome. And NCI is making its own effort generating the whole genome sequencing data, including the, 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 uh, the somatic mutations. And uh, so several large, uh, many large bulk banks uh, have uh, <clears throat> been generating whole genome sequencing data, and such as the UK Bio Bank Million Veteran Program and all of us. In the next few years, uh, we are going to see a large number, millions of whole genome data available. And so we need to be ready for analyzing such large data. And so the community has paid a lot of effort in the last few years to diversify the study population, both the GSP and the top are multi-ethnic. So as you can see, the, for the top med um, data, 60% of the sample are non-European. And the top med has many uh, phenotypes. And also uh, top med has a good portion of the participants which have the multi-omic data, such as RNA seq data, uh, methylation data, metabolomic data, and the protein uh, proteinomic data. So as you can see, for top mat freeze 8, which has 150,000 whole genomes, and there are massive uh, revirence. And uh, so for example, there are 5, 780 million and, uh, uh, SNVs. Among them, almost 70% uh, um, are singleton or doubletons. And the virus, uh, so there's a massive revirence. And the, over 97% are non-coding virus. And so how can we analyze those massive data? And also there are many external existing um, omic data, such as uh, genomics data, trans, uh, cri uh, transcriptome omics data, proteinomics data, and metabolomics data. So a natural question we ask ourselves is, um, those data are from different sources. And how can integration of the whole genome sequencing data and the multi-omic data uh, help us? So I will focus on two aspects. The first aspect is the integrate multi-omic data with the whole genome sequencing data through functional variance annotation to empower real variance discovery. And the second um, aspect is to integrate uh, whole genome sequencing data and the multi-omic data to understand biological mechanism of the human diseases. And with those efforts, and then that can be uh, translational, it can help with prevention, intervention, drug discovery, and also treatment. 
So I'm going to start from the first part and how can we integrate multi-omic data to uh, help with uh, real balance discovery. So uh, many approaches can be done. So this is our little effort. So we propose this uh, STAR method for real balance association analysis and which uh, boosts the power of real balance association analysis by dynamically upweighting functional variance using multidimensional functional annotation. So uh, to help with the, the annotation, and uh, so the uh, NHGRI GSP has annotation working group. And uh, so the group has been working together and helping uh, developing this fun uh, favor functional annotation database by integrating um, uh, functional annotation data from many different sources, such as ENCODE, ROADMAP, CLEANVAR, uh, GTAC, and so on. And so those annotations and the can help annotate the genome and uh, provide annotation of allele frequencies, conservation score, protein function, epigenetic, and so on. And so the goal is to annotate all three billion base pairs across the genome. And with this favorite annotation database as a bank backend database to annotate any whole genome sequencing study, such as a TopMed study and the GSP or UK Biobank. And then to analyze the real variance whole genome sequencing study, and one cannot perform individual variance analysis, and one can perform because the variants are too rare. So one can do the, either the gene-centric analysis by creating the coding mask, such as loss functional variance, missense variance, uh, synonymous variance, or non-coding mask, that is a promoter, enhancer, and so on. Also, one can cover the whole genome using the genetic region analysis by using the fixed window size, sliding window, or the dynamic window size. And it's important to help the community and to implement and this um, uh, whole genome sequencing analysis um, pipelines and so in the NIH data common. So the, the goal is to suppose the investigator only provide the whole genome sequencing genotype data and also the phenotype data and the analytic tool your analysis common can take care of the rest. So in, for example, one can after input uh, provide the whole genome sequencing data and then the hill can be used to QC the whole genome sequencing data. And then in order to annotate the whole genome sequencing data, one can use the favor uh, backhand database, use this favor annotator, and uh, then um, analysis comments such as Anvil about data catalyst and uh, to annotate the whole genome sequencing data. And then perform the analysis and using the star pipeline. And uh, so either in the analysis comment or a word uh, 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 um, uh, um, uh, data comment. And so it's important to pay attention to cost to make it uh, affordable. And uh, so the so right this this is a benchmark using the lipid whole genome sequencing data of top med freeze eight of sixty thousand samples. And you can see that for a gene centric analysis, it costs about four hundred dollar ish, and for sliding window analysis, it costs about uh, seven hundred uh, seven hundred fifty dollar ish. And by incorporating functional annotation and then the, the whole genome sequencing analysis of lipid data of, of TopMed Freeze 5 and it shows good results and as a gene level analysis uh, using different masks. So for example, if you look at npc one one the missense uh, variance on npc c one one is significantly associated with LDL. And we know that there's already a drug developed for uh, targeting towards npc one 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 to reduce the lipid. And also the is to for analyzing the promoter and the enhancer, a natural question asked to ask is whether we can improve the detection of the enhancer and promoter regions. And so this is how the data integration can help. But in particular, it will be useful to incorporate cell type specific heterogeneity. So we know that currently the bulk data, uh, bulk data mask variability across the cell type and cell state. And, but also in the meantime, we know many enhancer promoter regions and show cell type specificity. So therefore it's important to see how we can uh, use the cell level 
um, single, in particular, single cell level data and to help improve the annotation. So what, uh, so uh, in order to integrate the whole genome sequencing data with the single cell data, now let's see what we have right now. The existing single cell data mainly contains uh, RNA-seq data. And by analyzing RNA-seq data, that reveals cell type and the disease specific expression profiles. And however, limited availabilities uh, for single cell epigenetics data, such as uh, ATAC-seq data and the CHIP-seq data will be useful, such data can be generated. And the cell type specific variability in quantum accessibility and confirmation is critical to help understand the diseases. And to see whether the cell and the, the tissue specific annotation can help with the discovery. So here shows the number of discovery using tissue specific annotation for lipid analysis. As you can see that using liver, which is a relevant tissue for LDL, you can see one has more discovery. And so this is a, a encouraging. And also, can we move one step ahead? So uh, we know there are multiple cell types uh, uh, which are relevant to LDL, such as, such as hepatocyte. So what this means is this we, uh, we, it will be useful to explore the um, opportunity to imp improve real balance discovery and by using the cell type specific annotation from single cell data. And the several NIH, um, initiative um, are helping with this effort uh, on the from virus to function to diseases, such as an NHGRI IGBS uh, initiative, and also TopMed 2.0, which will generate single cell data. So the in, in the meantime, it's also emphasized the importance of coordination of NIH consortia effort and uh, across the different uh, initiatives. So let me move on to the uh, second part of the integration uh, using omic data and whole genome sequencing data to understand disease mechanism. So there are multiple genomics data, such as the analysis, such as the GWAS, which uh, studies association between SNP and the phenotype, and the EWAS studies association between methylation and the phenotype, and the TWAS studies association between expression and the phenotype, and the MQTL studies association between SNP and the methylation, and the EQTL studies association between SNP and the expression. So a natural question to ask ourselves is uh, how to integrate different type of uh, omic data together to analytically study the cultural mechanism using cultural inference, because uh, to uh, experimentally validate the mechanism, and it is expensive, we cannot do that for every single gene, every single disease. So therefore, it's useful to use a computational tool and also leveraging the cultural inference framework, which has been um, used in in the epidemiological study and the clinical trial to help with the data integration, understand the disease causal, causal mechanism. So in, for example, so here, suppose that we have this normal native aging EVA study. So one can look at the smoking to see whether that affects FEV through any particular gene. So in particular, AAHR gene. And so this, if this AAHR gene is associated with smoking and also associated with FEV, and then that indicates there is a mediation effect, or the smoking probably affect FEV through other biological pathway, then one can create this kind of mediation Manhattan plot. And this shows that um, the smoking affect FEV through AAHR. And also one can use the cultural mediation path analysis to understand the different cultural pathway of integrating different type of beta. So in this two example for gene A, one can look at the, whether the SNP affects the methylation and the this gene and expression and then metabolize and then CVD through any different pathways. And so here you can see that the, this pathway is most significant that indicate probably this SNP affect the expression of gene A, but affect CVD through other gene, not through this particular gene um, metabolized. To summarize, in the integrative analysis of whole genome sequencing data and the multiple 
multi-omic data can help empower discovery of real variants using variance functional annotation. And also it can help study the mechanism of the virus to function to disease. And cell type specificity is critical to understand variants to function to disease. So we need a single cell epigenetics data such as uh, ATAC-seq data. One minute, Shi Hong. Okay, well, I'm really good finishing it in one minute. And also it's important to continue effort on prioritizing greater diversity, not only in genetic studies such as the GWAS study and the whole genome sequencing study, but also a multi-omic study as well. Also, it's, it's important to leverage all existing data by um, to accelerate discovery by establishing mechanism for collaboration between experimental genetic epidemiological and the clinical consortia, such as GSP, TopMed, and IGVF, ENCODE, and GTAC, Human Cell Atlas, and the Biobanks, but not only within NIH, but also uh, uh, with the industry as well. And finally, cloud-based data access analytic platform and cost reduction is important. So it's important to develop efficient uh, data sharing and the harmonization uh, mechanism and also scale up support, scalable analytic tool and the resources in the cloud and also address the cost issue. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Yi Hung. That was, that was really great. Um, so I'll, I'll start off while waiting for the questions to come in. So you gave um, something that I just was really impressed that, you know, the state of the art is actually not very bad. It's quite good, You're making a lot of progress. But if you really want to scale this up, right, and include lots and lots more patients, I can think of two strategies. One is to engage many laboratories to kind of follow your model. And then the other is to centralize it uh, with several big laboratories taking on the scale scale uh, that you'd need to get that done, which which model do you favor? Um, I would think uh, that both models should be encouraged. So NHGR has been really good at establishing large consortia such as IGBF and also the GSP and so on. So the, in the meantime, we need to support as our ones. And so those are more like a investigator initiated a research. So I think both models are important. And also it's important to encourage collaboration between those large consortia and also individual labs as well. So this is something we need to think through how to establish this kind of innovative model to encourage collaborations. Okay, and then um, still waiting for hands, but um, what do you um, envision in doing this is, um, how about privacy? How are you gonna be able to deal with that issue? That's an excellent question. In particular, and uh, like uh, the Bob Bank is a particular, uh, the privacy issue is particularly important. So many data cannot leave the healthcare system. For example, using the Million Veteran Program, the data cannot leave the system. So what this tell us is we need to think about um, the analysis beyond the pooling data. We need to think about federated analysis, including the distributed uh, uh, analysis and using distributed learning. So that means we can analyze the whole genome sequencing data, for example, from a million veteran program and uh, the UK Biobank, TopMed, and so on, without sharing the data through federated learning. Okay. Judy? Yes, um, I'd like you to comment back on like Mike Snyder's five types of aging and you kind of use the term normal aging. So any comments about uh, kind of classification of aging over time? Yeah, I think that's a great question. As a matter of fact, biological aging can be measured using methylation. So it will be interesting to, to look at the biological aging using the methylation and then look at the biological mechanism of biological aging. Thank you. Okay, well, um, well it, I, I'm sure Ji Hong will be able to access the chat and, and continue the discussions and we can move on at this point to our second speaker, Tuli Lapalainen, 
Um, Thule is professor at the Royal Institute of Technology and the director of the genomics platform at uh, uh, SciLife Lab in Sweden, and is also an associate faculty member at the genome, uh, New York Genome Center. Her research focuses on functional genetic variation in human populations and its co and contribution to human traits and diseases. And she studies these both computationally and with experimental approaches. And she's been a pioneer in integrating large scale genome and transcriptome sequencing data to see how genetic variants, variation affects gene expression. So Julie, take it away. Thanks, thanks very much. And, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to share some of, some of the thoughts uh, regarding study design and, and sample collection for multi-omic studies in, in large cohorts. So this is, of course, a very broad topic. I will not claim to be able to sort of like cover the entire sort of area that, that we have here, but, but uh, I will share some of the kind of lessons learned from, from uh, some of these studies and that, that us and others have been doing over many years. So, so these points have already been kind of discussed a couple of times, but, but I just want to sort of reiterate where we are here thinking about adding multi-omic functional readouts to, to cohorts where we already have uh, data of genetics, uh, disease phenotypes, environmental exposures, and, and many other types of measurements, and where functional readouts really have potential to to um, add an important component of, of uh, um, disease risk. And, and in particular, in terms of being able to potentially capture uh, not just biomarkers and, and prediction of disease risk, but also potentially molecular mechanisms that are actually causally driving disease risk at the cellular level. And I think that we, we all agree that, that genetics alone or the classical, perhaps the classical precision medicine uh, uh, thinking about uh, getting phenotypes and, and genomes, that's not going to cut it, cut it alone. Um, and it's just a couple of quick examples that I wanted to mention here as, as concrete examples of added value of molecular readouts. Um, in clinical genomics of rare disease uh, diagnosis, transcriptomic data is actually already proving useful and it's uh, increasingly slowly but, but surely uh, starting to become actually part of clinical practice where I'm just highlighting here a recent preprint, but, but this and many other studies sh have shown that, that to, with, uh, for example, RNA sequencing of, of patient samples and adding that information to whole exome or, or whole genome information, you can actually uh, significantly improve the diagnosis rate. And in the complex disease uh, space, um, un <laughs> unsurprisingly, the, the situation is more complex, but, but there are very, very exciting examples. For example, this uh, paper from a couple of years ago where uh, RNA sequencing was able to inform for, uh, um, on an upcoming flare in rheumatoid arthritis uh, patients. And even though this signal was initially captured by differential expression analysis from, from uh, blood samples that, that uh, patients collected themselves, uh, it was actually then shown that this signal was driven by a specific cell type changing um, uh, before a flare uh, happened. But so if we want to think about how do we actually go from the go forward from here and build on these uh, examples of, of success, I want to highlight a couple of sort of aspects of study designs of current important multi-omic projects, many of them of course supported by, by the NIH. And, and this is not a comprehensive list, it wouldn't fit on, on, on a slide, but, but there are sort of like um, a little bit of two types of studies that, that we, have, we are talking about. There are projects such as GTEx, TopMed, for example, large plasma proteome studies that, that really have a large sample size and, and capture uh, population variation, intra-individual variation, genetic variation, sometimes, especially in the case of TopMed, also diverse ancestries, uh, sometimes clinical phenotypes as well. But then typically lack in terms of having um, very deep multi-omic uh, data that just due to kind of practicalities and costs, these are, these are a little bit more limited, and then also cell type uh, resolution. Whereas um, projects such as ENCODE and Human Cell Atlas, Human Protein Atlas have extremely deep uh, omic data and, and, with, and with that type of cell type resolution uh, from multiple different tissues. 
And these are kind of like very important axes to consider in terms of like, if we think about precision medicine, being able to address human genetic components, disease variation, inter-individual variation in general, and then really make that, that type of data equitable across, across diverse ancestries, we really need that population uh, scope. But then on the other hand, if we want to get in, uh, insights into mechanisms um, in that, that really kind of like happen at the cellular level, that type of resolution into cell types and, and, and multimodal uh, omics is, is really um, essential. And uh, in the next couple of slides, I'll discuss uh, some of the kind of lessons that we have learned working on GTEx and, and TopMed data analysis, especially focusing on biospecimen collection and, and analysis and, and insights from those uh, samples. So when it comes to GTEx, where of course the, the primary goal was to map uh, genetic regulatory variants across a large number of, of tissues and, and really kind of analyze transcriptome variation and genetic underpinnings. Um, the, the tissue sharing um, aspect of multi-omic data was, was anal analyzed at a, at a great detail. So this heat map here is showing the pairwise tissue sharing of cis EQTL effects. And one thing that was actually, at least for me, is somewhat surprising was how widely shared some of these cis EQTL effects are. It's, the sharing is quite high. We see structure that makes sense in terms of uh, sort of tissue relatedness that you would expect, but also a lot of sharing. And we also see that EQTL sharing, so genetic regulatory effects, are highly correlated with other types of measures that we can uh, get from these transcriptome and genetic uh, data. So, so um, measuring, for example, differential expression between different tissues or biospecimens can help to choose the least redundant tissues to, to take for further uh, larger scale analysis. One thing that jumps out of this heat map very clearly is that whole blood is really not a good proxy for most uh, other tissues. It is a very special type of a tissue being sort of liquided and, and, and everything. And this poses very, very significant practical limitations when it comes to large scale multi-omic studies. How can we actually sample non-blood tissues at scale for a reasonable cost? And uh, one, one recent project that is ongoing in my, in my lab is to uh, explore the use of non-invasive samples for scaling up biospecimen collection, where we have taken samples from uh, hair follicles, uh, just 10 hair, pulling them out, uh, buckles with saliva and urine, and then used a low-cost SmartC2 uh, library prep protocol to do RNA sequencing from these samples. And we were very happy to see that for hair and urine, we actually get extremely good quality RNA sequencing data. These, 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 these tissues like absolutely work for, for sampling um, um, cells uh, for, for transcriptome analysis. Uh, buckle is kind of okay. It can be made to work. Saliva is terrible. Do not try this at home. <laughs> um, it, it may be useful for other purposes, but transcriptomics is, is hard. And the, the, the GTEx tissues and, and the type, cell types that we capture in, in these um, uh, samples are, of course, dominated by epithelial type of, types of uh, cells, uh, the hair follicles are kind of like a little skin biopsy when you when you pull out the hair, but but there are interesting signals, for example, some related to cheetex kidney in, in urine samples, suggesting that maybe we capture some of those uh, cells as well. And these kinds of sampling protocols and thinking thinking along these lines can be a very powerful way to really kind of scale up transcriptomic studies in the same way as human genetic studies have been scaled up for really, really empowering, uh, amazing discoveries that were only obtained when the sample sizes got really large. But uh, when we dig a little bit deeper into the tissue sharing in, in GTEx with um, the cell type deconvolution or estimation of, of cell type composition in these tissues and look at sort of cell type sharing across the different tissues, how, how, how those, those things cluster, we actually see that the, the tissue sharing map is extremely similar to the cis-EQTL sharing. And what this means is that a lot of the tissue sharing of, of cis regulatory effects is really driven by cell type sharing across different tissues which is maybe not, not surprising, but something that is just really important to consider when we think about what does tissue sharing actually mean and what do we capture when we analyze these different tissues. And cell type composition affects not just tissue sharing, but actually all kinds of molecular variation where it's really the key driver. So here I'm showing an example of, of gene expression analysis of PBMC samples from the MESA cohort that is part of the Chopman multi-omics uh, pilot. And this is, and here like each dot is a gene and, 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 and here we have analyzed 
uh, what are the different kind of um, factors that, that explain variance in gene expression between individuals. And here's different cell types, uh, cell type composition really, really jumps us jumps up. And this signal is even stronger for methylation signal and, and also consistent with what we have seen in GTEx looking at, at what are the kind of major components of, of gene expression and uh, gene expression intra-individual variation and what explains those. And really kind of um, most intra-individual variation in gene expression is, is due to variation in cell type composition. And this is something where it's a little bit like a philosophical question when this variation is biological or when it is technical sam sampling protocols affect these things as, as well as kind of true biological signals. And where this becomes complicated is, is due to the fact that cell type composition is correlated with kind of a lot of other factors. So this is again analyzing the MESA data uh, and TopMed top uh, data, including a bunch of different genotype PCs, different types of clinical measurements, environmental exposures, et cetera. And one can see that there are a lot of correlations here where, where basic factors like, like um, ancestry, first principal component, age, sex, smoking, all kinds of things are actually correlated with cell type composition. And what this means is that if one just kind of like goes and sees like, okay, so how does, how does smoking manifest in gene expression or methylation? what you're going to capture is um, um, the cell type composition signal. And again, that's not a false positive, but it may change the interpretation of these signals. And it is not, I think, entirely clear how we would kind of, what are we supposed to do with this, this fact when we don't actually have vast amounts of single cell or specific cell type data from, from thousands and thousands of individuals. We have also shown in analysis that I'm not going to share you, with you today is that when we analyze gene by environment uh, EQTLs, those are also very often due to variation in cell type composition. So for example, smoking interaction EQTLs, it's actually kind of picking up the cell type variation uh, uh, signal there. So I think that it's important to, to kind of keep in mind that, that, that a relatively useful null hypothesis for many of these bulk omic cohort data sets is that um, any kind of cellular omic correlation with phenotype or environment is it can be due to cell type composition and then then kind of like go go from from there. Um, uh, the Topmed uh, data has been extremely valuable in capturing some of the diverse ancestries that have been very much lacking in functional omics uh, data. Here I'm showing an example of an, of an EQTL locus where the GTEx largely European, or, or this is the GTEx European sample, GTEx mostly a European uh, collection, uh, kind of like shows um, yeah, a nice signal, but, but a little resolution into the functional variant. And then when we dig into the different uh, ancestry components of, of MESA, we see uh, sort of traumatically improved ability to distinguish the fine, uh, the, the co uh, likely causal variant. And we can show this uh, across the genome that diverse ancestries help a lot with fine mapping. And this is, this is very valuable, especially for functional follow-up and many other uh, insights. And I think one important, uh, largely unanswered question thus far is whether molecular mechanisms of disease that we can potentially get insights um, um, for from multi-omics data could actually be more shared across ancestries and thus kind of easier to make, well, let's say, equitable, easier to get generalizable insights than genetic variation, where genetic variation, of course, allele frequency differences and linguistic disequilibrium is largely driven by population history that, that differs. Uh, versus the molecular mechanisms uh, of, of cells may be more universally uh, shared. And this is somewhat supported by the fact that causal variants um, for EQTLs and, and different types of genetic associations typically have highly consistent effects across ancestry, race, or ethnic uh, groups if we are just able to narrow down to the causal variant. And even when this is not the case, I'm showing an example of a population biased EQTL where the effect size differs between uh, African Americans and European Americans. Uh, the, the likely kind of hypothesis here is that, that cell type composition differs between ancestries, and this is manifesting as a, as a population bias EQTL. So to kind of like come, come back to where I started a little, um, 
um, some of the kind of um, different goals that we need to meet or the different challenges that we need to address, of course, depend on what we want to use the multi-omic data for. So if it's for a biomarker use, then really the, the most important consider considerations are scale in terms of sample size, uh, amount of the data, uh, generalizability, for example, across ancestry, sexes, age, et cetera, and of course, cost. And there are major improvements in, in all of these factors. When it comes to then understanding molecular mechanisms of disease and using multi-omics data for this, this is, I think, generally a more challenging task, but this is really essential for interventions. We, we cannot really develop drugs unless you understand some of the causal drivers. And here, getting cell type resolution and deep multi-omic data is really key. And I think it's important to think about how do we integrate these large cohort data and insights that we get in this type of a space with experimental perturbations in model systems with CRISPR and single cell and, and different types of whatever organoid or, or other cellular uh, models where like both of both approaches produce highly orthogonal data in, in my opinion, um, with, with different unique uh, advantages and, and challenges, but, but ultimately hopefully uh, getting to some of the shared biology that we are in interested in. And of course, thinking about biomarkers and yeah, molecular mechanisms are not mutually exclusive goals. So uh, to finish, I want to highlight some important open questions and current gaps that we have in, in these data in, in thinking about study design, especially sampling. So I was kind of asked to talk about cost considerations, but I, I'm sort of refusing to do that because I don't think that we have a good idea of the cost benefit models, even for genetics and for functional data multi-omics, we need a lot more work. Um, we, I don't think we really know we, what kind of multi-omic applications really require us to have single cell resolution in large cohorts, or how far can we get with, for example, cell type deconvolution approaches or, or other approaches that, that use uh, bulk data that is still much more scalable uh, from a practical perspective. And how often do we actually need to get the true disease driving cell types? Uh, we often don't know what those are instead of some sort of proxies. If you need developing neurons, that's going to be a huge practical challenge. And we don't, we don't really know where, how, how well we, we can use other cell types to capture still biologically informa in, informative effects. Um, what are the best assays for which applications? Uh, lots of work to do there. And then, as I, as I mentioned, how do we actually best integrate functional insights from large cohorts and experimental perturbations? And I want to highlight some of the major sort of gaps and challenges that we struggle with currently. Diversity of the cohorts and model systems for functional analysis is, is uh, quite atrocious. Um, TopMed is doing good work, but that's, that's not enough. Um, and then when it comes to data, data organization, data sharing, data integration, when it comes to functional genomics data, this is uh, actually challenging. Uh, genetic data sharing is, is a piece of cake com compared to the complex functional uh, measurements where you have very complex biological and technical batch effects. With that, I'll, I'll thank people. I want to specifically mention Silva Casella, who's a postdoc in my lab, who's been trying the, the TOCMED uh, work, and Francois Agüe from the PROD, who's a long-term collaborator in GTEx and, and MESA TOCMED analysis. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Tuli. That, uh, that was truly spectacular. Um, just getting back to these, um, you know, the deconvolution of the bulk data from GTEx, um, it's something we heard earlier uh, in discussion, do you think that would be, rather than go back and try to repeat all that at the single cell level, would it be better to um, do uh, analyze data from at-risk groups or uh, people with a specific phenotype and then try to deconvolute it when you kind of at least have a working knowledge of what's going wrong? Yeah, um, I mean, so so if one would do bulk analysis in uh, in a specific disease cohort that has a specific phenotype, I, I think that's not necessarily going to help you with the cell type uh, sort of a challenge. And I think there is, a, yeah, I I think that we need to kind of develop these insights in. I mean, in, in any case of like disease, uh, individuals with a specific phenotype can be informative, but also just doing this in a general population level is, is I think, something that we need to pursue further. Okay, David Craig, you have your hand up. I guess, yeah, I have basically a very similar question. I get back to decomposition. And so you also had measures of like B cells and everything. So you actually had a measure. And yeah. so it's almost like either there's no utility of blood or it, we definitely do need to do single cell because you 
had the means, you must have had measurements. And I say this because we've looked at something similar and come to a similar conclusion. I'm not sure that deconvolution could solve this. I'm just afraid that we need single cell sequencing because I'm watching neutrophils change all over the place. And this is a really accessible. And I'm just, what is, I mean, what's your real take? Would you, if you had to put your money down on which one, do you really need the single cell or can you pull it off some other way? Yeah, so I mean, honestly, I don't know. I think so. So, so Mesa also has cell counts. So we have done it sort of computationally deconvolution using those approaches, and then then using the actual cell counts. And they're highly correlated. It works pretty well for blood. But but I we have absolutely the same experience. That is kind of like that when almost every single one that you see, you first need to show that this is not just cell type, or or maybe it's cell type, and that's actually important and interesting and. Um, yeah, and I don't think that we have a generalizable answer to that. And of course, like cell type composition can in itself, especially thinking about biomarker use, that can be very useful. Like if, if it captures a signal that actually is a useful marker for something, it doesn't matter if it's driven by, by cell type necessarily. And I think that plot is also, it can be more variable than many other tissues. I mean, it's kind of, these are immune cells whose actual biological job is to respond to external stimuli and maybe some like, I don't know, pieces of skeletal muscle are not so difficult to deconvolute. Who knows? <laughs> I don't. I think, we, I, I think we actually need data to answer this in a data-driven way and not just from plot. Okay, uh, Nilanjan, if you could put your question in the chat for Thule, um, because it's time to move on, and that goes for everyone else also, um, that would be great. So our next speaker is Marjorie Brand. Uh, Marjorie is a senior scientist at the Center for Stem Cell Research at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. And um, her research interests are in the regulation of gene expression at the level of transcription and chromatin. And uh, she's working on this in the hematopoietic system. And she wants to uh, use this to understand how hematopoietic differentiation from stem cells to mature cells occurs in um, both benign and malignant hemologic diseases. So Marjorie, welcome. Great, uh, thank you very much. I hope you can see my screen. Uh, so thanks very much for uh, the invitation and uh, so I'm, I'm really happy to present some of our work here. So I'm going to start uh, by uh, uh, the acknowledgement slide. So what I'm going to present is a collaboration between my lab and the lab of Ted Perkins at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute and the lab of Jeff Farnish and Nathan Price and Corey Funk at the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle. So we, we are interested in the transcriptional regulation of erythropoiesis and erythropoiesis is the process which the hematopoietic stem cell differentiates to give rise to red blood cells. And this process is highly regulated by a number of transcription factors and cofactors. And these proteins work together as networks to promote differentiation towards the erythroid lineage, while at the same time, they inhibit differentiation towards uh, other alternate hematopoietic lineages, uh, such as uh, the megakaryocytic uh, lineage that leads to the formation of platelets. Now, what's uh, interesting is that the transcription factors that drive erythroid differentiation are expressed at extremely high levels uh, towards the end of differentiation, was are really important to promote differentiation. However, most of these factors are also expressed in the hematopoietic stem cell, although at very low levels, which suggests that the amount uh, or the dosage of transcription factors uh, plays a critical role for sulfate determination. Now, previously, we studied this process using mass cytometry, and uh, which allows us to measure proteins in single cell. And by examining both uh, cell surface markers and transcription factors, we were able, uh, during a time course experiment, we were able to reconstruct the dynamic trajectory of erythropoiesis from the early multipotent progenitors uh, to the terminally differentiated erythroid cells. And by using the, a, a similar approach, we were able to show that increasing the amount of a non-erythroid transcription factor called FLY1 in early progenitors is able to deviate the cells uh, away from their preferred erythroid trajectory to take on a megakaryocytic fate. Now, these results, uh, together with the results of others, have shown that antagonist transcription factors uh, that promote mutually exclusive uh, hematopoietic lineages are co-expressed in early progenitors, and that changes in their relative levels or changes in their stoichiometry is what underlies the sulfate decision process. 
So our goal was to establish a network model of sulfate decisions that can integrate these quantitative changes in transcription factor over time. And for this, we needed to measure changes in protein stoichiometry. Now, another reason uh, why we wanted to measure uh, protein stoichiometry and changes in protein stoichiometry is because despite everything that we've learned uh, from genomic studies about the binding of transcription factors to their genom genomic sites, we still don't know how many transcription factors are there uh, compared to their binding sites, and we don't know uh, whether cofactors are present in limiting amount compared to these transcription factors or whether cofactors are present uh, in large excess, which would definitely facilitate uh, their recruitment. Now, uh, if one is to measure uh, protein stoichiometry or changes in the stoichiometry, it is necessary to use approaches that provide an absolute quantification of proteins. And for this, we decided to use a targeted uh, re uh, mass spectrometry approach called Selected Reaction Monitoring, or SRM, uh, which when coupled with the spiking of known amounts of isotopically labeled peptides that serve as internal controls can provide an absolute quantification of proteins. Now, our model system to study human erythropoiesis is an ex vivo differentiation protocol where the CD34 positive hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells are first isolated from cord blood or from bone marrow, and those cells are then differentiated to the erythroid lineage using a combination of growth factors and cytokines. Now, because we wanted to build gene regulatory network, we also wanted to measure uh, RNA. Uh, so uh, for these experiments, we harvested cells at regular intervals during the course of erythroid differentiation. And uh, we have measured mRNA levels by RNA sequencing. We have provided absolute quantification for over 100 proteins by SRM. And we have also uh, provided relative quantification for thousands of proteins using eye track at the different time points. Now, first focusing on the RNA uh, results here, I'm showing the RNA seq base, the retroid trajectory over time. And you can see that there is a nice progression from the hematopoietic stem progenitor cells at day zero to the uh, terminally differentiated retroid cells. Now, looking at the protein data by hierarchical clustering uh, of the 103 transcription factors for which we obtain absolute quantification, you can see that there are different clusters and that these clusters appear to be temporally co-regulated. So the first question we wanted to ask uh, was whether uh, there is a good correlation between protein and mRNA during erythropoiesis. And what we found is that for most genes, there is a, um, a, a positive correlation. However, for some genes, there is a low correlation and sometimes even a negative correlation. So here I'm showing as an example, the FLY1 gene and the GATA2 genes for which, as you can see, there is an almost perfect correlation uh, between changes in protein and mRNA levels during erythroid differentiation. However, for other genes, such as GATA1 or TAL1, you can see the protein level is increasing much faster than the RNA level, suggesting an important contribution of the post-transcriptional regulatory mechanisms. So the fact that we found major discrepancies between mRNA and protein abundances for master regulators of erythropoiesis suggested to us that gene regulatory networks should uh, also incorporate proteins. And to do this, uh, we collaborated with computational biologist at Perkins and uh, his postdoc, Daniel Sanchez, and they built a dynamic network model of erythroid commitments that incorporates those quantitative changes in transcription factor protein level. So in that model, uh, mRNA are considered as the targets, uh, proteins are considered as the regulators, proteins can be activators, uh, or they can be also repressors. So basically what they did is to use ordinary differential equations to explain the change in mRNA levels by the change in protein abundance. And this is the model that they have obtained around 14 transcription factors at different time points uh, during differentiation. Now, what distinguishes this model from previously published model is that it quantifies the strength of the identified regulatory relationships. So, for example, if we focus on uh, the regulation uh, between rung 1 and GATA2, you can see the activation of GATA2 by rung 1 is much stronger than the activation of rung 1 by GATA2. Now, the model is also dynamic in that it reveals changes in regulatory relationships over time. So at day zero in stem cells, you can see the strongest regulatory relationships involve proteins important in uh, stem and progenitor cells. However, those regulatory relationships are progressively decreasing in strength and they are fading away. And at day 10, they have been replaced by other regulatory relationships that involve proteins that are important in uh, differentiated erythroid cells. We also noticed that the model correctly recapitulates the timing of the transcription factor cross antagonisms that underlie the sulfate decision process. And uh, 
uh, you can see, for example, here at day zero, the model was able to capture the cross antagonism between SP1 and GATA1, uh, which regulates a very early sulfate uh, decision between the myeloid and the erythroid lineage. Now, at day two, uh, the model was also able to capture a second cross antagonism between KLF1 and FLY1 that regulates a subsequent sulfate decision between the erythroid lineage uh, and the megakaryocytic uh, lineage. And at day 10, you can see that both cross antagonisms have completely uh, disappeared in committed cells as expected. Now, um, another interesting aspect of the model is that it allows us to compare the strength of the different transcription factors to the regulation of their target genes. So if you focus on the activation of the GATA1 gene here, you can see that the contribution of the transcription factor TAL1 is about twice as important as the contribution of the transcription factor GATA2. And interestingly, this is not because TAL1 is a stronger activator of the gene per se, as you can see the activation strength is actually lower for TAL1 and for GATA2, but what happens is that TAL1 is three times more abundant than GATA2. So here we are in a situation we ha where we have a transcription factor TAL1, which is a weak but abundant activator of the GATA1 gene, and the GATA2 transcription factor, even though it's a stronger activator of the gene per se, overall it contributes less to its activation because it is less abundant. So with these types of model, we are really able to quantitatively dissect these regulatory relationships, which is very important if you want to be able to control erythroid differentiation, both in vitro and in vivo. So what about cofactors? Uh, so far, I focused on the DNA binding transcription factors, but we know that these proteins work through the recruitment of cofactors. So we also used SRM uh, to determine the amount of co-activators co and co-repressors in the nucleus. And to our surprise, we found that uh, co-repressors on average are 10 times more abundant than DNA binding transcription factors, which are themselves 10 times more abundant than uh, co-activators. So overall, these results show that the nucleus is a highly repressive environment uh, where co-activators are limiting, which suggests that the DNA bound transcription factors must compete with each other uh, to mediate the recruitment of a, a limited number of co-activators. So where are we going from there uh, in terms of data uh, integration? So, so far we've used ordinary differential equations to integrate the RNA and protein data. And this was advantageous for us uh, because um, uh, ordinary differential equation use continuous variables. So we could integrate the inhibitory and the activating influence of the proteins uh, and to, to design a dynamic network. Uh, however, uh, going forward, we are now acquiring a lot more protein data. Uh, we continue to use SRM in a much more high throughput manner, and this will allow us to uh, measure all transcription factors and cofactors, co so thousands of different proteins uh, in the nucleus. We are also measuring RNA binding proteins because recent work uh, using deep learning suggested that RNA binding proteins are good predictors of mRNA expression levels, and we've certainly seen this uh, in our system as well. So it suggests that uh, RNA binding proteins that regulate post-transcriptional mechanisms such as uh, splicing or uh, RNA stability or protein translation uh, should also be integrated into the models. We're also acquiring uh, different types of data such as protein-protein interactions, protein-DNA interactions, uh, histone marks, uh, etc. So here I have listed some of the current methods that integrate proteomic data with other omics data. Uh, however, none of this approach um, uh, are flexible enough to allow us to integrate these different types of data. Usually these approach are very tailored uh, to specific measurements. So we're gonna have to develop new methods uh, for data integration, keeping in mind that uh, these methods have to preserve uh, the dynamic and quantitative aspect of these measurements. Uh, it's also likely that we'll need new methods for data visualization. And to end, I will just uh, briefly talk about power analysis and experimental design. So for the experiments that I showed you, we did not use power analysis um, for the, the reason that we simply didn't have uh, enough materials from individual donors to be able to, to measure simultaneously mRNA and protein uh, at the same time point. So instead, what we did is to um, combined the stem and progenitor cells from dozens of individual donors to do uh, one of those uh, time course. So we've done two replicates of the time course. And uh, however, for validation, we were able to use uh, additional donors. 
for, for validation of the network where we have knocked down specific proteins and uh, verify whether the links that we had identified, the proteins were going up and down as predicted. Also because we did not use uh, DNA binding information to build the model, we could then use the DNA binding information to validate uh, the network. However, uh, now that technology advances, including uh, single cell mass spectrometry, which will soon be a reality, even for low abundance protein like transcription factors, uh, in that case, uh, power analysis will become very important, uh, not only to determine how many, how many uh, uh, individual donors or how many patients uh, have to be studied, but also uh, to determine what measurements will be the most informative. And uh, the, um, the use of single cell uh, data will allow us uh, to perform now the same type of analysis with a lot less cells. So we will now be able to actually do the same type of measurements in uh, blood cells coming from uh, patients such as um, uh, thalassemia patients or diamond black fan anemia patients or different types of patients with different blood disease. And uh, in that case, power analysis will become important now, uh, I'm not a statistician myself, but discussing with statisticians, the consensus appears to be uh, that power analysis for multi-omics data is highly complex because all the different types of measurements have their own uh, level of sensitivity, dynamic range, limit of detection, and limit of quantification, which makes it really hard um, to, to uh, establish power parameters that are compatible with all these different types uh, of, of measurements. But maybe the most important thing uh, we have to ask ourselves is the specific questions that we want to ask. So in our case, rather than identifying um, different like proteins that would be differentially expressed between patient and, and uh, healthy control, what we really want to be able to do is to build networks uh, such that we can, uh, networks from the patients, such that we can identify among the differentially expressed proteins, the one that are the most likely to actually have a functional importance uh, for, for the disease phenotype. One minute, so, Marjorie. Yep, so actually I, I, I'm done. Uh, so I'll stop here and I'll be happy to take any question. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much. That was great. Wow, you've got all con a ton of hands in the air already. So David, Craig, go ahead. Oh, but that was left over. Oh, you're just left over. Ali, are you next? No, I didn't have my hand raised either. <laughs> but it's still, I yeah, somebody's asleep there. But so Marjorie, thank you for um, for that talk. You really kind of brought us into a new area, um, looking at the protein and trying to correlate that with all the other omics we have available. Um, what percent of the genes don't have a correlation between RNA and and protein levels? Uh, I it's a lot, but I didn't know if it was half, more than half, less than half. Right, yeah, so it depends how you see correlations, but like, let's say that they don't go in the same direction during right. differentiation, that would be maybe 30, 40%. And uh, so it's, it's quite a lot. And, and you have different types of, um, of negative correlation. You can have things that go a little bit, um, that go in completely different directions or some things that go a little bit faster or a little bit slower. So it's, uh, but overall, yes, I would say, uh, like very different correlation is about 30%. So I think um, maybe you would disagree with this, but I'm gonna try. You would say that uh, if we're ever going to use multiomic analysis to get at mechanisms, either of health or disease, um, it's, it's not enough to do uh, RNA. Right, that, that's what we, we really like to believe. I mean, and, and also beyond protein, just levels, of course, what we want is post-translational modifications because that affects function um, but, and, and other uh, measurements. But yes, I, I really believe that uh, like RNA alone won't be enough. There are also, another thing I didn't mention is total level of mRNA or nascent mRNA. Uh, we should also be measure, measuring maybe nascent mRNA, which is not done in many, many, many multi-omic studies because that's a better uh, measure of like uh, a dynamic process, let's say. Andrew? 
Yeah, hi, excellent talk. Um, I work in the megakaryocyte side of the lineage. And so I think maybe there's a, a broader point here, this is excellent work, but uh, maybe a broader point for the workshop in terms of rare cell, or cell types that are still uncharacterized well. And I think that's true of platelets and megakaryocytes from omics data. Uh, there's a lot of work going on now, but um, as wonderful as GTEx and ENCODE and all those projects are, there's really uh, no data or a paucity of data uh, in those cell types. And I think that's a, an area for future growth in terms of uh, brainstorming a little bit, where are the rare cell types that we still haven't characterized well? Um, and I'm sure there are many more in the, the brain and the neuronal region and in the kidneys and, and other uh, organs. So not a question, but uh, maybe you want to elaborate as well. Yeah, I mean, I mean that that's a great point. And so, some of those databases also are more... Um, have different types of database, have different types of cell types. And I think it was a blueprint one that had a lot of hematopoietic uh, data uh, that we did not find in other, um, other databases, yeah, but still not true. enough. Yeah, but <laughs> so, it's a, it, and still N equals two or three or something. So exactly. You don't yeah. have enough. Marjorie, AJ Palai would like to know, how did you obtain the rate constraints for oh. the different uh, <laughs> differential equations? Yeah, so the rate constants, so I'm not a mathematician, but I know they, they used it from, from the data itself. So they estimated, uh, you know, because it's a kinetics. So that was, uh, that was estimated from those measurements themselves. So that's probably not a um, good enough answer at the mathematical level. But um, yeah, that's, that's what I could say about that. Okay, well, um, I would just like to add, I thought that was a great session. I really want to thank the speakers for their, uh, the care they took to put those uh, presentations together and by respecting the time so we all had time to ask questions. Uh, now is the time for a break, um, well earned, and it will be for 15 minutes. And everyone uh, should meet back here at four o'clock. And if you could, please stay connected on Zoom so that we don't have to go through all the the readmitting people to the uh, the rooms, and um, if you have use your virtual hand clap for our speakers, now is the time.